Hello, Malcolm here, and welcome to Tuesday Teaching Tips. This is episode 267, and today I am answering a question from my friend Chen. And thank you ever so much for asking this question. And I'm going to summarize his question as something like this. Should we serve in a church context where we are not gifted? In areas where we don't have gifts, is this spiritually wise or unwise? And how do we how do we interpret the particular situation in Acts chapter 6 to give us some insight into this? So the church was growing. He uh, mentions to me, Chen, uh, in Acts 6, some widows were being neglected. The apostles asked the church to choose those who had wisdom and who are full of the Spirit, it says, to help in the distribution of food. His question is, Regarding church life and the different ministries in the church, there are different areas of church that need taking care of. And he's always been of the opinion that people should help in the areas they are called in and have gifts for. Uh, but in this passage, the brothers are chosen. It's not clear if they had gifts in those areas or maybe they might have been called into another aspect of ministry. It's perhaps they might not have been willing to do this, but they were still chosen. So he says that he can see the benefits of uh, 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 driving church duties, having the church involved in decision making. But he's struggling, and understandably, I think, with the idea that people can be just thrust into roles that they might not be qualified for, uh, willing to do or called to do. So can I shed any light on that? Well, I don't know. You'll have to be the judge of that. But a few points briefly today and let me know what you think. This is a teaching tip episode so it's not just about if you like an answer to the question but it's more about how do we find the answer, how do we think, how do we process this kind of issue. So a few thoughts. Firstly uh, churches always have problems don't they? They always have unmet needs, they always have things that come up. Indeed the book in uh, the, the church in the book of Acts uh, exemplifies this they have internal and external uh, challenges uh, back in chapter 5 they have the internal challenge of Ananias and Sapphira which is solved by two dead disciples rather radical and then we have an external uh, problem in from verse 17 uh, following when the apostles are persecuted now here in Acts chapter 6, we have an internal problem between the Hebraic, uh, the Hellenistic Jews and the Hebraic Jews. And after this, we have another external problem with Stephen um, uh, being confronted and ultimately being martyred. So th we have this flow, and I think that's significant to the positioning and the recording of what we have here in Acts chapter 6. Maybe Luke is telling uh, Theophilus, uh, and perhaps the Spirit is reminding us that church is by nature always will be messy but God is at work in all of it and so when we dig in to the detail it's important we don't miss the bigger picture of God is at work and that's true. Now a few thoughts about this passage in Acts chapter 6. First of all it occurs to me that healthy leaders, leaders that are leading in a healthy way, understand and accept their limitations. It looks like the apostles up until this point have been generally overseeing the need of people who are uh, in need of, uh, say, extra food. Back in chapter 4, uh, things are brought to and put at the apostles' feet in verse 35, and then it's distributed to anyone who has need. And we don't know precisely who does the administration of it but it's placed at the apostles feet there must be some decision making they have to, to make so they're involved at least on some level in this distribution is getting beyond them in Acts chapter 6 the church is getting bigger and there are more challenging issues having understood it's beyond them they also recognize that perhaps they're not and I'm speculating a little bit here perhaps they're not culturally um, the best people to solve the problem because the problem is between Hellenistic Jews and Hebraic Jews, and of course they are all Jewish Jews. I mean, they are all Hebraic Jews. So maybe they're not the right people to solve the issue. However, they don't wash their hands of the situation. They look for solutions, and that's what healthy leaders do. They look for solutions. The apostles here do not indulge in shaming and blaming anyone, although there clearly is a problem because there's a complaint going on here. 
but what they do, even though they don't deal, they would deal with the detail, they do set the parameters. They say we need men who are full of the Holy Spirit and full of wisdom. So they set those parameters. And then in a very faith-filled way, I think a little risky perhaps, they let the church choose. They decide to let them make the decision. And so the church go away and, and uh, wrestle with this. And what we see next is that a spirit-led church will prioritize those with the need. Because it says that they chose these, these men and it pleased the whole group. It pleased the whole group, verse 5. In other words, the Jewish people and the, or the Hebraic speaking and the Hellenistic speaking, uh, Hellenistic people, it pleased both groups. All were pleased, indicating that love and humility is dominating this process. And I think in the, in the areas of meeting needs and using our gifts or, or trying to serve in areas where we're not particularly gifted, love and humility must play perhaps the biggest part in this whole issue. You'll notice that all the men that are chosen are, have Greek names, which seems to imply they must have all come from that part of the community, the Hellenistic Jews. So the Jewish, the Hebraic Jews are happy with, let's pick some men or let's allow these men to serve in this area. A lot of humility, a lot of love, and we need to sort this out because we have brothers and sisters who are being neglected. Let's, let's sort it out. So a few thoughts from this. It looks to me like problems need the right kind of person, not necessarily the person with the right gifts. Let me say that again. Challenges in our church congregational lives need the right kind of person to be involved to solve the situation or to at least progress it to somewhere healthier, rather than necessarily looking for the person with the right gifts gifts. The priority is the right person, not the right gift. Isn't that always the way? Because God is able to do anything with anybody and he blesses humility, doesn't he? Rather than gifts as such. A good book I'd like to recommend but is by John Ortberg and it's called Overcoming Your Shadow Mission. It's a short book. I have a Kindle version. It doesn't take long. You could read it in a couple of hours, I think. Uh, very profound and not directly addressing the issue we're talking about today as such, but does deal with giftedness and is a good, um, it contains some good warnings about over-reliance on gifts. He says this on page 50, just does John Altberg, like Samson, so think about somebody gifted, he was very gifted, like Samson, you might be extraordinarily gifted, but if you don't develop the character to support your gifts, they will actually become destructive to you. Your shadow mission will win out and your gifts will crush you. And if you've been around for a while, you've seen uh, very gifted people of God, men and women, who've been crushed by their gifts because that came to mean more to them than serving in love and humility. So when, when someone refuses to serve in an area outside their giftedness, the, I, would, I wouldn't say they're wrong, but I would ask everybody around them and themselves to pray and check. This is not just them saying, no, 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 no. I want to be in my gifted, gifted area of giftedness, perhaps because that's where they feel valued rather than where they want to, where God wants them to serve. Or perhaps that's where they get their affirmation. Perhaps they get a sense of accomplishment. Perhaps they get a sense of I matter in this church because I'm serving in this area with my gift. Well, that, that can be problematic. So just we need to check that. It does, uh, interestingly, say nothing in this passage about the, the previous experience of these men, about their gifts, about their talents, or about their qualifications. We know they're full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, but that's not very specific to this issue between the Hellenistic Jews and the Hebraic Jews, is it? So maybe the specifics of the giftedness are not that important. Longenecker, in his commentary on this in the uh, expository Bible commentary, says that evidently the uh, giftedness of wisdom 
refers to guidance by the Holy Spirit and skill in administration and business. He thinks it does. He thinks this wisdom issue is about skill in administration and business. But if I dare to disagree with uh, Longenecker, I would say that's just not there, is it? I can't see it. Maybe it implies it, but it would be an implication rather than an obvious uh, setting out of this being the issue. And therefore, we need to be a little careful about drawing such a conclusion. There's nothing explicit there in the text. So the text being sparing in its detail, I think we need to be careful regarding the conclusions we draw, including the ones that I draw here today. So let me know what you think. These men, thinking about it, may have been the ones trusted to plan a solution for the problem rather than do the work. Maybe they didn't do the distributing. Maybe they were the ones who figured out how that could be done well. They had the responsibility delegated to them to sort out the challenge, but not the detail. We don't know if they were gifted at running the first Christian food bank, if you like, or something like that. We just don't really know. The fact that Stephen and Philip, who are in this passage, appear later in Acts 7 and Acts 8 and Acts 21 as preachers, you, well, evangelists for, uh, from Philip's perspective, that seems to indicate that they weren't stuck in one role with using one gift by the look of it. It is certainly true that gifts are meant to be exercised. Uh, Romans chapter 12 does tell us that gifts should be used. We have different gifts according to the grace given to us. Prophesying, uh, serving, teaching, encouraging, giving, leading, showing mercy. Yes, these gifts are given to the church and are meant to be used. But that doesn't mean it's always wrong for someone to serve where they are not gifted. Now, I will say this, however. That's different. Serving in an area where you're not gifted is different from being shoehorned into serving in something necessitated by a narrow church culture. We do it this way. We only do it this way. And, and it's, a, pers it's a, a contextually local decision that's not, that cannot be necessarily backed up by scripture. It's, it's something that's disputable or contextual, but it's not, it's not directly in scripture. If we get too narrow in the way that we lead our churches and force everybody into that particular mold, then we're going to be forcing people into areas where they're not gifted. And we're going to be neglecting the use of the gifts that God has given them where they could serve. That is dangerous on one level and is very sad on another when a church congregation doesn't get to benefit from the amazing gifts that God has given that church just because those people don't fit that mold. So serving where we are not gifted can be helpful. I would suggest when it develops Christian character, it helps us to be humble, serving in humility and love. Serving in serving where we're not gifted can be helpful if it enables us to connect with people in different life circumstances to ourselves. That can be useful. And it can be okay, I think, when serving in that way is temporary. Serving outside our gift set, if it's temporary, uh, to serve perhaps an emergency or short-term need, because it needs to be temporary before, um, and we need to stop before we do damage to ourselves or to uh, other people. I think in the local congregational context, the questions we want to ask ourselves are perhaps these. How much of a disaster is it if a need goes unmet? In this context, it had to be sorted out. But sometimes we create problems in our churches by looking for solutions for things we want to get done that don't actually need to get done. How much of a disaster would it be if this isn't sorted out? How essential is it to the well-being of the church members, to the congregation and to our impact on the world? I remember a friend of mine saying uh, when I asked him whether his church had a website, he said no. And I said, what, what do you mean you don't have a website? He said, well, we don't have anybody that's qualified to run a website. And so if we don't have anybody, we're not going to do it because we're not going to do a rubbish job and stress somebody out, out by forcing them who are not gifted to, to design or to run a website. And I thought that is very sensible. Should, does a church these days really need a website? Well, you'd, you'd think so generally. But on the other hand, will that church fall apart if it doesn't have a website? It doesn't have someone qualified. 
this could be extended to many areas of church life. So ask that question first. Is it a disaster if it is not if this is not this is not done? Therefore, if it is not a disaster, do we have to force someone to serve in this area where it's uh, not their giftedness? Second question. How injurious would it be to someone, a particular person, if we ask them to serve in an area not within their gifts? For some people, it's a stretch. It's not really that much of a problem. For other people to serve in a certain area, it would crush their spirit. So I am a form phobic person. I'm also dyslexic. If you asked me to serve in administration for a church, not only would the church <laughs> be problematic for the church congregation, it would also crush me. I, I know people, some people love spreadsheets. I talk to my friends who love spreadsheets. I'm going to have actually coffee this afternoon with a friend of mine who loves a spreadsheet. I'm very happy for those of you that love spreadsheets and I'm glad and it's a really important thing. But don't make me use spreadsheets. It's going to be bad for the church, bad for me, bad for everybody around me. That's, that's an example where you don't want me using too many spreadsheets too often. But for other people, it would be a stretch. And that's probably okay. And the third question we might want to ask is, in what way might someone or a group grow in Christ-likeness by serving, even though it's not within their gifts to do so? For example, let's say someone isn't particularly um, gifted with children, but they might still want to serve on a Sunday in children's ministry, because it might help them grow. Maybe that's not a long-term thing they may wish to do, but perhaps for a, a, a month of Sundays or, or three months, they could go and serve in children's ministry and grow, grow in Christ-likeness. There are limits to this. I, as someone who cannot sing should absolutely not ever try song leading. Uh, I, that's just one of those things, isn't it? Unless it's an emergency. Um, but a lot of us could serve in areas, whether it's on a Sunday or other aspects of church life, even for a season, because it would grow us in patience, in perseverance, in kindness, in long suffering, in, in being gracious and merciful. I mean, in all kinds of ways that by serving outside our gift set, we grow. And Christ came to this earth and served in all kinds of ways that were difficult for him. Uh, maybe we should take an example from that. So what are your thoughts on this? I hope you find this helpful. I thought this question was really interesting and a very helpful one. I will tell you this as I, as I wrap up. I am absolutely a fan of people discovering their gifts and serving using those gifts, whether it's uh, Myers-Briggs or the Enneagram or Strengths Finders or various other tools you can use to find your strengths and your gifts and, and, and talking to other people to help you discover them and finding the right channel to use them I do think we 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 are healthy, healthier when we do that, and people around us are benefited more. The church congregations we are in are generally going to be healthier and blessed by that. So don't misunderstand me about this. I think it's very significant that we serve in the areas of our giftedness. However, there are good reasons to serve outside of those areas to help us grow, to meet an emergency need, to show the love of Christ to other people, to empathize and connect with people, and, um, and we should not neglect that. The biggest caveat to all of that is, is to me as a leader of a congregation and to others of us who are leaders, is to not force people to serve where they are not gifted because we have some kind of philosophical approach to ministry that may have some principles in the Bible, but then it's not a command. We need to allow people and help people, encourage people to find the right channel for their giftedness. And if a need in the congregation cannot be met and it's, the church isn't going to fall apart because of that, does it really matter? In Acts, Acts chapter 6, it did matter a lot. Many of the times that we're faced with these issues, maybe it doesn't really matter. And we can let it go and ask people to just serve where they are gifted. Well, let me know what you think about this. Uh, leave a comment anywhere you hear or see this recording, if you wouldn't mind. Uh, please leave the comment uh, publicly because we, we can learn from each other that way and we learn best when we are learning in community. If you know anybody that might benefit from this, please pass the link on. If you'd like to connect with me, do so on Facebook or on my website, malcolmcox.org. You can also drop me an email, malcolm at malcolmcox.org. 
And until the next time, I hope you have a terrific Tuesday and a wonderful week. Take care and God bless.